All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's 2 o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining and participating in the New England Wetland Webinar Series that's hosted by Newly Pick. And happy American Wetlands Month to everybody. Uh, my name is Audra Martin. I work at Newly Pick, and I will be your moderator today. So today's webinar is a programmatic five-year review of the Massachusetts and Lucy program, for which the Massachusetts Department of Fish and Game is the sponsor. The statewide in Lucy program provides compensatory aquatic resource mitigation through preservation, enhancement, and restoration projects, and we will hear all about that shortly. Uh, I'm very excited to welcome our speakers today. First, introducing uh, uh, briefly the, the in Lucy program is Taylor Bell, and Taylor is the mitigation program manager for the New England Regulatory District of the Army Corps of Engineers. He has 11 years of experience with the Corps and has worked with multiple districts throughout the Southeast, including Galveston, Mobile, and Wilmington districts. And prior to his current position, he was a Corps project manager for Rhode Island and Connecticut. So welcome, Taylor. Following uh, Taylor, we will hear from the Massachusetts Department of Fish and Game staff, including Elizabeth Dan Teola, who is a new addition to the Mass Massachusetts MLC program as of December 2019. Prior to joining Fish and Game, Ms. Dan Ciola worked on environmental monitoring, restoration, and policy projects for several environmental consulting firms and nonprofit organizations such as the Charles River Watershed Association and the Connecticut River Conservancy. She holds a master's degree in nat natural resource management from the University of New Hampshire. And also on the line and joining us for the question and answer portion, we welcome Ashley O'Shea, who is the program administrator for the Massachusetts NLUC program. Ashling manages program development and implementation for the NLUC program, including mitigation project selection and funding, collaboration with federal, state, and other partners, and evaluation of program outcomes. She has spent more than 20 years working on environmental policy and planning in Massachusetts. So welcome and thank you to each of you. Newy Pick is pleased to host this wetland webinar series courtesy of funding from EPA Region 1. And if you're not familiar with Newy Pick, we are a regional commission that helps the states of the Northeast preserve and advance water quality. I'm excited to share that we recently released a new logo and strategic plan. So you may see a fresh new look for us, um, but it doesn't change who we are or what we're doing. We're even more committed than ever to helping our state uh, in the Northeast preserve and advance water quality. And I'm happy to have a new look to help us do that. So Taylor, I'm making you the presenter. Um, there we go. Yeah, thank you. Okay. okay. Thanks, Taylor. Um, and it's it's good to see some familiar names in the uh, attendee list. Um, you know, I miss some of you people that I haven't seen in a while. Um, Bruce Ladd included, who's in that attendee list. Um, Nonetheless, you know, the majority of what I'm going to be sharing today is the program that she kind of built from the ground up. Um, however, you know, we're going to try to keep moving forward with it and, you know, do what, you know, she thought would have been good as well. Um, so, but before I introduce Ashley and Elizabeth, I'm going to kind of give an overview of the rest of the ILO programs that we have in New England. Um, and some minor background that um, Elizabeth will get into is that so basically an NLUP program is a third party provider of compensatory mitigation for applicants that can choose to go that route in order to provide impacts associated with core permits and state permits. Um, not all of our ILO programs are strictly run through, through the core and their permitting actions. Some of the actions are also run through the state. And to kind of start off, um, we have the Vermont in Lucy program. And the sponsor for the Vermont in Lucy program is Ducks Unlimited Incorporated. Uh, Vermont in loop fee program or Ducks Unlimited in loop fee program has some of the largest in loop fee uh, restoration sites in New England. Um, they have, I believe, four service areas, and right now we almost have projects in all those service areas, and so we're moving forward, but they have some of the largest. Uh, moving to Connecticut, um, the National Audubon Society Connecticut chapter is the sponsor of that ILF program. When I say sponsor, um, the sponsor is who runs that program or who's basically in charge of providing um, commit store mitigation projects to the core or the core and the state. Um, so we have about 13 projects in Connecticut. Um, for New Hampshire, they're one of our older ILF programs. 
Um, that is a core and a state sponsored ILF program. So that means that um, state impacts are paid into the program as well as um, core permit impacts. Um, New Hampshire's program has been around um, since 2007. So they are one of the older ILF programs in the nation. Um, and that being said, they also have more than 100 separate individual projects. Um, Connecticut, New Hampshire, and Maine all run through an RFP, um, and MAS program has the option to too, but an RFP is a request for proposals or they send out um, an invitation for uh, to land trust for possible mitigation sites and mitigation throughout their service areas. Um, moving down, we have Maine Natural Resource Conservation Program, or that's run by NDP. Um, they can also utilize state permitted impacts as well as current core impacts. They also have 100 plus projects and they were, they've existed since 2007 and they are home to the largest in Lucy program or in Lucy site in Maine, I mean in New England at 2,000 acres plus. Uh, moving down the line, we have one of our, I think it's our newest in Lucy program is the Atlantic Salmon Restoration and Conservation Program. Um, it started going in 2019. Um, and what we kind of look for in that is that they also run off the RFP, but mitigation takes place by evaluating critical habitat units that may impact the Atlantic salmon um, for streams, and that's mainly located in the northeast area of the state. Um, then we have the Maine Bernal Pool Special Area Management Plan, or the SAMP, with the sponsors, the town of Orno and the town of Topsom. Um, and what that is is a sign agreement between Maine Department of Environmental Protection, Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the Corps and the town. And what this ILF program does is it provides a framework for streamlining permitting for impacts to vernal pools. Um, we don't have a project in that yet, but um, we're looking forward to some, you know, soon as well. And then last, the Massachusetts and Lucy program, and I'll let kind of uh, Ashling and Elizabeth get more into that. But for that, I was going to give a screenshot of all the ILF programs, our individual projects in New England, we have close to 300 um, separate in Lucy sites or in Lucy projects throughout the Northeast. Um, so you can see a lot of them are concentrated during the coastal and the southern areas. Um, most impacts get mitigated for uh, within the same service area that the fee is paid in through. And with that being said, I'm going to pass this on to Elizabeth. Thank you, Taylor and Audra for the warm welcome. Uh, so Ashley and I wanted to take this opportunity to provide a review of the first five years of the Massachusetts in lieu fee program. Um, in lieu fee programs in New England have traditionally conducted reviews of their programs every five years. Um, so this year we'll be conducting our first review and uh, creating a report that summarizes our findings. Um, so this presentation will be a um, preview of what that report will look like. Uh, in today's webinar, we will discuss what an in lieu fee program is, the structure of the Massachusetts in lieu fee program, ongoing in lieu fee mitigation projects in Massachusetts, and potential future directions for the in lieu fee program in Massachusetts. Uh, after I run through these topics, we'll open the floor for questions with Ashlyn. So under section 404 of the Clean Water Act, the Army Corps of Engineers requires compensatory mitigation for impacts to aquatic resources. And aquatic resources includes not only traditional wetlands, as you may think of in this wetlands working group, um, but also estuarine and marine resources and streams as well. The Corps authorizes about 22,000 acres of wetland impacts and requires about 49,000 acres of compensatory mitigation annually for context. An in lieu fee program or ILFP 
allows core permittees to make monetary payments in lieu of providing mitigation on a project site. This allows the IMU fee program to pool funds and support larger projects that are more likely to be successful in the long term. The IMU fee program sponsor uh, uses those funds to support mitigation projects that can take the form of uh, preservation, restoration, enhancement, or rehabilitation of aquatic resources. And just of note, the permittee is still required to avoid and minimize impacts to aquatic resources before a payment is allowed into an ILFP. <clears throat> there are a couple of different uh, structures that govern how an IMU fee program operates. Um, primarily, the programs operate under the guidance of the 2008 Federal Mitigation Rule. Um, but there are also standard operating procedures that are issued by the core districts. Um, the New England District standard operating procedures are currently under revision. Each program also operates under the guidance of a core approved program instrument. Um, so these instruments can vary between uh, different state programs. The pro each program has a program sponsor uh, which as Taylor mentioned is typically a state agency or regional conservation organization. The program sponsor is responsible for establishing what the fee will be uh, for the monetary payment uh, for impacts. The sponsor also collects those payments and assumes responsibility for the ultimate mitigation projects. And lastly, IMU fee programs operate with oversight from an interagency review team which can include representatives from other state and federal agencies that have expertise um, in wetlands resources and other types of mitigation projects. So an in-lieu fee program operates through the sale of credits. A permittee will purchase credits based on the acreage or number of linear feet of impact that their project is proposing. And the sale is um, kind of moderated using ratios that are established by the core. Um, so temporary impacts may require a lesser fee than a permanent impact to resources. And the mitigation that is required um, in lieu of, of those impacts occurs at a greater than one-to-one -one ratio in order to account for uh, time lag between the time that the credit sale occurs and the initiation of the mitigation project. Um, this ratio also accounts for the likelihood of success of the project. Um, certain types of restoration projects may carry greater risk than others and therefore a greater ratio is required. So a new in Luffy program operates by selling advanced credits uh, up to a maximum amount that's established in the program's instrument. The advanced credits are allocated to the program's service areas and the resource types um, for which the program sells credits. Service areas are typically defined geographically by a physical boundary such as a hydrologic unit code, um, but in some cases they may be defined by political boundaries such as counties. And across the country, um, in Luffy programs typically separate credits for wetland and stream impacts. And they may also separate them uh, to a further degree than that, but at a minimum, uh, wetland and stream credits are typically tracked separately. After the mitigation project is complete for any advanced credit sales, those credits become available for sale again. The Massachusetts in lieu fee program was established in 2014. The program sponsor, as Taylor mentioned, is our State Department of Fish and Game. And we work in four service areas. Um, the far western portion of the state is our Berkshire Taconic service area, uh, followed by our Connecticut River service area, our Quabbin Reservoir and Worcester County service area, and then lastly, our coastal service area, 
uh, which we have subdivided into a coastal north, coastal central, and coastal south sub areas. A uh, significant portion of our presentation today will focus on this coastal service area because we've seen a lot of uh, permit sales or credit sales and uh, subsequent mitigation projects in that area. Um, and the Massachusetts program sells both wetland and stream credits. Uh, so here we have the goals of the Massachusetts in Luffy program as they were established in our program instrument. Uh, you can see that the program aims to use um, expertise, tools, and program experience from the Department of Fish and Games three divisions. Uh, and using uh, those existing programs that are run by those divisions, uh, we aim to protect and restore aquatic resources, including wetlands and streams, um, primarily that have connectivity to high quality resources. And that ties into the goal of having projects that are successful over the long term uh, by making sure that they fit in with a high quality landscape context. A question that has come up a few times as Ashley and I have been doing public outreach about the Massachusetts in Luffy program is, you know, really where are the funds coming from? And so we've done some preliminary analysis to determine generally what sectors are paying into the in Luffy program. And you can see here that primarily transportation um, and utility sectors are providing a significant portion of the fee money that comes into the program. Um, we do receive funds from some other sectors, and in some cases that may be provided by even more projects, but because the impacts of those projects are so small, um, they don't contribute as much funding into the, into the program as these uh, transportation and utility sectors. And this is generally a trend that we've seen with other in Luffy programs as well, that um, transportation and utility sectors uh, provide a significant portion of the funding because there's only so much that can be done to avoid impacts when creating um, transit and utility corridors. Uh, so here we have a map that shows uh, some of the permitted projects that had impacts on aquatic resources in Massachusetts in the last five years and the locations of the mitigation projects that we'll discuss today. Um, this map is updated through 2019. So the Massachusetts in Luffy program just completed another uh, round of funding with a request for proposals cycle uh, as Taylor described. Uh, so those projects are not on this map yet at this time, but they will be included in our five-year program report. Uh, so as I mentioned, in our Berkshire Taconic service area, we have uh, done one mitigation project, which we'll discuss towards the end of this webinar. Um, although we have collected some fees in our Connecticut River and Quab and Worcester service areas, uh, we don't have any mitigation projects in those areas at this time. Uh, so we actually are going to be advertising uh, funding in those areas in our 2020 request for proposals. Uh, and as I've alluded, uh, we have a lot of activity in our coastal service area. Uh, so we'll dig into some of those projects a little bit more in the upcoming slides. Uh, so to date, the Inlu Fee Program in Massachusetts has funded 10 projects in total. Uh, four of these were restoration projects, and six of them are land preservation projects. Uh, all the restoration projects that we funded have occurred in tidal environments, uh, and two of the projects that we funded are being used to mitigate stream impacts. Uh, so largely, the projects that we're funding are uh, relying on the sale of wetland credits. Um, and as the previous slide showed, the projects that have been funded to date have been in those two service areas, the Berkshire Taconic and Coastal Service Areas. 
So now we'll take some time to really dig into the details for the coastal service area. Uh, in, the coastal in the coastal area, uh, fees have been charged to compensate for a couple of different types of impacts to aquatic resources. Um, this includes impacts to winter flounder, uh, any sedimentation impacts that may occur as a result of a development project, <clears throat> fill or dredging in wetlands, and then also shading of aquatic resources uh, or potentially salt marsh as well. Some examples of potential coastal and fee project types include removing tidal restrictions, or removing uh, unneeded structures or debris that are found in aquatic resource areas, enhancing or restoring salt marsh, eelgrass, uh, or fish or shellfish habitat, and permanently protecting land resources uh, and specifically to allow for the migration of salt marsh inland uh, due to sea level rise. As I mentioned, our coastal service area has been the most active of the four service areas in Massachusetts. Um, nine of our 10 projects have occurred in this service area. Uh, five of them are land conservation projects. And 2019 was the first year that we issued a public request for proposals. Uh, so we're pleased to announce that we now have projects with two external project sponsors as of this year. Um, and the, all four restoration projects have occurred in the coastal service area, and those have all been sponsored by the Department of Fish and Game. Uh, so the first project that I'd like to discuss today is an eelgrass restoration project that was sponsored by the Department of Fish and Game's Division of Marine Fisheries. The restoration occurred in Middle Ground in Salem Sound, as you can see on this map. And the restoration project occurred over um, multiple years, and so it helped to diversify the planting and ensure that the project was successful by um, using different seasons and sources for planting material. Uh, so, as I mentioned, the Division of Marine Fisheries uses a uh, genetic diversity strategy and harvests material from multiple donor sites uh, when they're conducting eelgrass restoration, as you can see on this map. And for any of you who may not be familiar with eelgrass, um, eelgrass is a type of submerged aquatic vegetation that grows in um, estuarine and marine environments and our division of marine fisheries uses uh, these this checkered plot design to um, plant eelgrass restoration sites uh, and they use these pl white plastic quadrats when they're doing monitoring and estimating uh, percent cover and other statistics like that uh, so i'll Flip through two slides here that show the planting design for the eelgrass restoration sites. Um, the primary takeaway message here is that, um, again, we do use a greater than one to one mitigation ratio because there is some failure um, in eelgrass restoration projects. So you can see um, the squares that have been X'd out in this diagram are places where eelgrass transplants were not successful. Um, and in the event that the Division of Marine Fisheries is able to determine the cause of the failure um, and decide that it's not something that's based on the geography of the site, they will replant it. Um, but if they feel like there are site-specific conditions that cause the failure of the planting, um, they'll actually replant in a different location. Um, so those were the results of the plant, the first round of planting. And here you can see the second round of planting was somewhat more successful uh, than the first round. So that was helpful for that project. Uh, one component of in mitigation projects 
um, that's different from other restoration projects is that we do require a minimum of five years of monitoring for these restoration sites. Um, so in this case, the Division of Marine Fisheries used uh, two different reference sites where they collected data and um, measured the same variables at the transplant site, which is our project restoration site for comparison to ensure that the mitigation project was successful. Uh, so as you can see here, in the case of eelgrass restoration, because it is a relatively high risk type of restoration, the Division of Marine Fisheries does a uh, site check one month and six months after planting, and then initiates the five years of monitoring that are required for the in-loop fee program. So some of the findings of the monitoring uh, include a couple of stressors that may have made some of the, the transplant sites less successful than we would have hoped. Um, and in photo A, you can see there are some algae that's growing in the eelgrass transplant site, and that's making the eelgrass stressed and, and less um, successful. And then in photograph C, you can see um, some green crab has also come into this eelgrass restoration site, um, and that's, again, affecting the health of the vegetation at the restoration. Um, however, despite these stressors, um, the metrics that the Division of Marine Fisheries is using, which include um, shoot density and canopy height, have been showing positive trends over time. And it's our hope that that will continue through the remainder of the five-year monitoring period. Um, so in terms of the credits being coming available for sale, again, uh, when the mitigation project is completed, uh, at the beginning of the, the restoration, we've allocated different percentages of the total credit uh, value of the project to specific deliverables or performance standards for the project. Uh, so you can see here that the actual planting of the restoration site was weighted more heavily, uh, and then monitoring um, is, is conducted to release the remainder of the credits for the project. So moving right along, uh, our first preservation project is the Namaskat River Preservation Project. Um, this was conducted with the Department of Fish and Games uh, Mass Wildlife Division. The, this site was selected because of a couple of different reasons, which I'll walk through um, briefly. Uh, one of those is uh, proximity to other protected open space. Um, so we can see here that there's some existing state-owned uh, conservation land on this side of the Namaskat River. Um, but now by conserving this area in red, um, we're adding some protected area on the other side. So that creates a more complete uh, corridor by having protected lands on both sides of the river. Um, the Namaskat River Preservation Site, uh, the Inlu Fee Program is receiving credit for preserving 87.5 uh, acres of land, and that's after we've excluded a utility easement on the site for which we will not take um, any mitigation credit. And there's about 23 acres of freshwater wetlands on the site and uh, almost 65 acres of upland buffer area. Site ranks highly for a couple of different Biomap 2 resources. Um, it has a least disturbed wetlands complex and a habitat for species of conservation concern. Uh, not surprisingly, due to the location of the Namaskat River, um, the site also provides um, buffer, aquatic buffer, and wetland buffer. Uh, and in addition, the site also is considered habitat um, for in, uh, rare and endangered species under the Natural Heritage Program. 
the Mass Wildlife was also able to overlay the State Wildlife Action Plan data um, with their proposed conservation parcel and found that uh, the site ranked highly as a key site for the State Wildlife Action Plan and also provided above average climate resilience based on the Nature Conservancy's data set. Uh, so achieving these multiple mitigation objectives makes the site uh, relatively competitive uh, for an in lieu fee mitigation project. Our next preservation project is a salt marsh preservation project on Town Farm Road in Ipswich. The property is a 29 acre parcel. And the parcel consists of 24 acres of salt marsh and five acres of upland buffer based on our recent um, baseline documentation reporting process. Um, again, the site ranks highly based on Biomap 2 data layers, provides habitat for species of conservation concern, as well as turn foraging habitat. The site also is recognized as a priority natural community. It provides Biomap 2 core habitat, and the entire site is designated as Biomap 2 critical natural landscape. So our next restoration project is an artificial reef that was constructed off the coast of Yarmouth, Massachusetts in Nantucket Sound. Again, this project was sponsored by the Department of Fish and Games Division of Marine Fisheries. And the artificial reef consists of both structured habitat and sandy bottom. Um, it's about an acre of proposed habitat enhancement. And this project was able to move forward relatively quickly because it was proposed to be done in an area that had already been permitted as an artificial habitat site, uh, which made the, the permitting process go quite quickly. Uh, so you can see here, the constructed portion of the artificial habitat is actually just you know, concrete and granite construction debris. Um, so there's also a nice recycling aspect to this type of project. And here we have the different performance standards and, and metrics, again, that are used um, to determine the release of credits associated with the project. And so both the actual construction of the project and monitoring results play into how the credits are released. Um, in this case, rather than uh, looking at the health of vegetation on the site, um, the Division of Marine Fisheries is again monitoring a reference site and the restoration site, but looking at some species diversity and size and age class metrics um, for the fauna that have colonized the artificial habitat. Our next restoration project is the construction of a fishway on the Willowdale Dam in Ipswich, Massachusetts. So back to the North Shore. Um, this is a photo of the Willowdale Dam. Um, as I mentioned, a dam removal would probably be a, a priority over constructing a fishway for an in lieu fee project um, because it would provide more uh, aquatic resource function. However, in this particular case, uh, it's not going to be possible for the dam to be removed. Um, the Foot Brothers Canoe and Kayak Rental Company um, operates out of this site and um, removal of the, the dam structure itself would cause uh, potentially some economic hardship there. Um, so in this case, a fishway was deemed a more appropriate solution than, than removing the dam itself. Um, so there is a, a fishway at this structure at this time, uh, but it's been deemed to be somewhat ineffective. Uh, so the Division of Marine Fisheries determined that because many 
other dam removal projects um, on this particular river are moving forward, that it would be uh, important to improve fish passage at this site. Uh, so what they propose to do is to install uh, a new uh, steep pass fishway on the other side of the dam and leave this existing uh, concrete fishway and possibly modify it to support yield grass pass or excuse me um, yield passage. So the release of credits for um, this fishway pro project is based on uh, the upstream area that will be accessible to diadromous fish after the fishway is installed. Um, and in this case, it's actually an impressive about 14 and a half miles. Um, so the crediting is weighted he more heavily for the area that's immediately upstream of the dam. And then uh, once we start to get further away from the dam, um, the actual credits produced by the open area is reduced somewhat, um, but for a total of almost 100 and almost 250 stream credits, um, this this project will be a successful stream crediting for the Inlu fee program. Uh, so again, the project will be credited based on its both its design, uh, its operations, and the actual use of the structure by anadromous fish species. Um, so, we, as I mentioned, we did approve some new Inlu fee projects this spring. Um, so we don't have nice uh, photos or, or really anything to go through um, what those projects are providing to our program, but I can mention what they are so you can look for them uh, on our website once we've got them posted or in our uh, 2020 annual program report. Uh, so new projects that were approved this year include three land preservation projects. Um, one is uh, located at Rattlesnake Hill in Sharon, Massachusetts. Uh, so that land was actually acquired by um, the Department of Conservation and Recreation over the winter, and they are currently contracting uh, the completion of a baseline documentation report for that site. Um, the second project is a called a Parker River Connector Salt Marsh Preservation Project in Newberry. Um, and the acquisition of that land is anticipated to occur this spring. And lastly, uh, we also approved another uh, preservation project on Lions Brook in Westport. And that acquisition is anticipated to occur in June. Uh, so all of these projects are, I mentioned at this time because they're in our coastal service area again. Uh, so shifting gears, uh, we did see that we have one project in our Berkshire Taconic service area. Um, this service area has been the least active in terms of uh, permit fees collected, um, but we do have one mitigation project that's been implemented to date. It is a land conservation project and it was sponsored by Mass Wildlife again. Uh, and we don't have enough funds to support a new project in this area at this time. Uh, as Taylor mentioned, we do try to make sure that the fees that are collected in a particular service area are redistributed to mitigation projects in the same service area. Uh, supporting similar resources to the types of resources that were affected by the permitted project. So the project that we do have in the Berkshire Taconic Service Area is our Williams River Preservation Project. Um, this is the preservation of about 49 acres of land. It's located in West Stockbridge and again um, this project was a priority because of close proximity to existing uh, wildlife management areas that are owned by the Department of Fish and Game. Uh, so it's creating a nice, uh, well-connected, diverse, protected landscape. 
Uh, so the site itself includes about 28 acres of forested wetland, 11 acres of upland buffer, and it has frontage on almost a, a mile of riverfront. The parcel also ranks highly for uh, Biomac 2 habitats, including wetland 4. Um, and you can see it's very close to habitat of conservation concern, um, but that is not present on the site itself. The site also ranks highly as a state wildlife action plan key site. Um, and has, the, at least the southern portion of the site, has relatively high climate resilience potential. So to wrap up today's webinar, uh, just point out a couple of new challenges and opportunities that the Massachusetts in Luffy program uh, will be facing in the next couple of years. Uh, something that can be a bit challenging for Inlu fee mitigation programs is um, a three-year timeline for implementing the mitigation projects from the time that fees are received. So there is some pressure under the federal mitigation rule to make sure that fees are distributed within three years of the time that the sponsor takes them in. Um, but in some service areas, there, there may be some difficulty accruing enough fees to fund a really uh, good project in that three-year time period. Um, but that difficulty can also be used as an opportunity to really focus on collaborating with partners so that we can leverage in new fee funds and other available sources of funding to make sure that good projects are able to get off the ground uh, without significant delays. Another aspect of Inlu fee programs is um, trying to sort of anticipate where new fees will be coming in so that we can tee up projects and have them ready to go uh, once money comes in the door. Uh, so something we can do to help move that along is to monitor trends in development and figure out where we think it's likely that uh, someone will need an Army Corps permit that might require in lieu fee mitigation. Uh, so one trend that we are anticipating is a potential increase in permitting around the I-495 belts, uh, which would be our Quad and Worcester service area. Um, and that is based on data analysis that's been conducted by Mass Audubon. Um, their losing ground report uh, this year and in previous years have emphasized the um, kind of stress for development in that area, which makes it likely that we might see some uh, wetland impacts in that area as well. But again, um, these aren't necessarily negative things. Um, having this potential for increased activity in this area uh, can allow the Inlu fee program to develop relationships with planning agencies uh, so that we can get a sense of what projects might be coming down the pipeline and uh, really take the time to do some outreach and figure out what mitigation projects might be available to offset those impacts. And lastly, um, the five-year review is a time when an in-lieu fee program can adjust its program goals, particularly if there's a need to better capture the available mitigation opportunities. And I mentioned this because I don't think at the time that the Massachusetts and Luffy program was established, anyone really anticipated how much more active the coastal service area would be than some of our um, other service areas. And so over time, there may be a need for us to better integrate um, new restoration techniques in uh, estuarine, marine, or other types of coastal resource areas into our program planning so that we can be sure to um, request those types of projects as we're issuing requests for proposals. Uh, so with that, I think we'll open the floor to questions.
Yeah, thank you so much, Elizabeth. And I see Ashley's joined us back here for the Q&A session. Um, so there's uh, two ways that you can ask a question. Since we already have um, a couple in the one is, um, could you explain what Biomap2 data layers are and where they come from? The Biomap2 was de developed um, a number of years ago, and um, uh, it's a uh, and the biomap two is is uh, there's several data layers in there as you can see that help to identify what the um, comes from like a variety there was a variety of of partners collaborated on this and um, including um, mass um, Department of Fish and Game Natural Heritage and other um, you know agencies and um, and partners and the idea here was to really um, you know, look at where um, throughout the state if we we're going to focus our efforts on, um, you know, on preservation and um, on, on protecting resources. Where are the the topmost? Um, uh, I think you know maybe it's like the the forty percent uh, of sites uh, that have the highest um, ecological integrity. Um, maybe and I know some of the work that uh, was done at UMass Amherst with them. Um, uh, the the caps on the ecological integrity index was used with this as well. But as you can see, there's layer, there's various layers uh, that uh, sh you know that can be used to show where um, the rare and endangered species is, where there's um, a biomap, uh, where there's like aquatic core, significant aquatic core, wetlands buffer, critical natural landscapes. So there's a lot of different like uh, factors and data that went into deciding and figuring out like which were the top percentage of those based on everything that was available that would be the most important to protect for um, for connectivity for different types of species etc. I would add if it wasn't clear um, that Biomap 2 was an exercise that was done in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts so if you are working in a different state this data may not be available to you. Right, so I'm going to go on to uh, the next question. Um, who determines the performance standards? Okay, so the uh, the performance standards for the mitigation for the Inlufi mitigation projects are developed in collaboration with the Army Corps and also with the interagency review team and the project um, sponsor. So during the process of you know, once a project gets to the stage where it's been accepted and it's moving forward um, as a potential ILF uh, in Luffy project, and we're developing a more detailed project plan and, and a mitigation plan for the project, that includes coming up with uh, performance standards that will get reviewed um, with the um, our in Luffy program staff. And as I mentioned, um, the core ultimately uh, approves projects like the core ultimately um, uh, will decide whether or not a project uh, has merit as an inlu fee project or not um, and gets input from its in, um, interagency review team which the Massachusetts um, IRT the interagency review team includes um, uh, National Marine Fishery Service EPA US Fish and Wildlife Service and it also includes our Coastal Zone Management Office and the Massachusetts Department representative from the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, so we want to make sure that as we're developing the performance standards, that there we get, you know, we get a lot of input from people with expertise um, in um, both the Inlu Fee program itself and the specific kind of project and resources and the goals that we're looking for from that mitigation project. I want to jump back to one question that was about the biomap and the, it's how often are the data layers updated? Mm, yeah, actually, yes. I don't know actually how often, the, and it, I don't know that there's a, a schedule, uh, a regular schedule. I'll have to look into that, but it's been a few years, I think, since the bio, it was obviously a biomap one and then there's a biomap two. Um, I did hear that there's, you know, it, there is there is some ongoing effort to look at what might need to be um, revised and updated in the future, but I don't know when that will be. Okay, and moving on, if you have any suggestions for options to control the green crab, and that was with the eel grass slides. Uh, I don't at this point, although um, as our division of marine fisheries, um, I'm sure some of their uh, staff might have would have more expertise on that. 
Okay, um, moving to the next question. Are credits established by wetland types or by the functions and values of the wetlands that are impacted? Okay, so and when we're talking about the, the credits in terms of the credits being established, there's a few different um, pieces to it. So uh, when the uh, when the when a permittee is being required to purchase credits, um, the core will and and Taylor can jump in at any point if I get this. Um, if you want to add to this, the the core will determine what um, the number of credits, wetlands credit or stream credits, that the permittee needs to purchase based on um, the acreage of impact or the linear feet of impact of that particular type and or that particular uh, resource, and it will be categorized by. Um, you know, is it a uh, is it a freshwater? Is it a tidal? Um, is it um, uh, and it'll be specified. Is it in, if it's freshwater? Is it you know palustrine, emergent scrub, shrub? So we track all that. Um, the um, on in terms of when we do a mitigation project, you know, Department of Fish and Game um, or any of other project partners. Uh, and we're uh, assessing achievement of the performance standards to determine how the project will get credited. Did it meet its performance standards? Because we, when, once we sell those credits, we have an obligation as Department of Fish and Game to fulfill those to do the mitigation. And so when we're evaluating the project through performance standards, we would be looking at um, you know, the functions of the resource as well. Uh, so kind of two different sides to it. But I might ask Taylor if you want to add something about, if you have anything else to add about when the core is deciding what, how much credits the permittee has to pay um, or has to buy, um, how the functions and values are considered at that point. Um, sure, and I was just going to say, Ashley, you did a, you did a, a good job kind of describing our system and the credit purchasing um, and how we get to, you know, where we get to, or I guess how the sausage is made. Um, but some of the things we consider, um, you know, at times when we're thinking about what is required for mitigation or how many credits you need to be required, is that oftentimes the state of Massachusetts uh, will require mitigation on site outside of course mitigation. Um, but more times than not, um, the mitigation rule and kind of what we follow is that we require at least one to one. Um, unless there is alternative um, avoidance and minimization measures taking place. The more times than not, we're looking at one-to-one -one, um, loss for resource um, and then through credit purchasing. And then on the other side of the, the coin, when you're looking at credits produced by projects, um, we either look at, you know, the function gained from a restoration project or a dam removal project um, or a, a title restoration or with, you know, uh, the subtitle project. We're trying to measure some type of functional lift, lift that has occurred to give us wetland credits. But as Ashley you know, correctly said, we have two types of, of credits in Massachusetts and throughout some of the other programs that we have stream credits and we have wetland credits. Uh, but within those wetland credits, we have subsets of credits. Um, and those subsets kind of get into tidal, non-tidal. Uh, then you start looking at intertidal uh, and subtitle and forested, you know, PEM, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I hope that kind of answered the question or was enough of an answer. Okay, I think that that generated some additional questions. So quickly get to these and then I have a few more and we're right at three o'clock. So hopefully we can we can get to all these. Um, is credit purchasing synonymous with paying the fee? Um, so uh, credit purchasing synonymous with paying the fee, yes. Uh, so when the core issues uh, the permit, um, that permit will specify uh, the um, number of credits uh, and the type that need to be purchased. Um, the um, uh, the permit, the permittee, or the you know the applicant and the permittee will. Um, contact the Inlu fee program, we have set rates for different types of credits. And uh, once they make the payment to um, Department of Fish and Game, we will send a letter, a receipt of sale um, that says, you have paid this amount to purchase X many credits. Um, our Department of Fish and Game has now taken on the legal obligation for the mitigation and will 
notify the Corps as well. So once that happens, the, per the permittee um, is able to move ahead with the project that the Corps has permitted. They can't move ahead with that until they have you know, demonstrated that they have purchased um, the credits from us. So, so that's, that's how they're related. So they'll purchase the credit, they'll pay the fee, and that will purchase you know, half a credit or 100, you know, 100 stream credits, um, and then that's um, we will issue the the letter, and they can they can then they've done their part, and then we're on the hook. Then Department of Fish and Game, we will then um, you know we hold the money in a trust, in a mitigation trust, a mitigation a trust fund, um, and um, as Elizabeth said earlier, then we pool the funds to do the you know to achieve the kinds of mitigation that we're looking for. Um, is there a list of credits with the subset? And hopefully that question makes sense to you. Was that was there a list of credits with the subsets? Is that what it is? Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, yeah. So we can provide if somebody's asking like how they're broken out broken out the different types of credits and subsets. Um, yeah. In fact, um, in our our annual report um, and our 2019 um, annual report is on our website, which um, I think. We have um, we can give you a link to, and if um, if uh, that's a, a good place to maybe look and see all the different types of credits, and it's broken out by was it you know a marine, um, you know was it estuarine subtitle, estuarine intertidal. Uh, so there there is a breakout. Um, we can provide a list if anyone if anyone wants it, but the annual report is also a good place to to start. Uh, yeah. The next question is. Could you uh, describe how sites were selected for the eelgrass restoration sites, and were they less likely to be affected by runoff? Mm. Um, the uh, uh, Division um, of Marine Fisheries, um, the eelgrass, uh, st the staff that's got expertise in, in working in eelgrass, um, they did, um, a, you know, as part of the, actually, it's an interesting question to bring up because one of the other new projects that we've just funded, um, which is going to get starting soon, is um, and as, as another eelgrass restoration project with uh, Division of Marine Fisheries that is specifically going to look at site suitability factors um, and develop um, a model to look at the uh, to do some test planting and really get a better understanding of where the the best sites are for eelgrass. Um, for eelgrass planting, um, so uh, I can't I can't speak directly to everything that went involved was involved in selecting the sites for the current eelgrass project. Um, that actually started just before I came on board, uh, but we can certainly provide some more information on um, uh, the project, the mitigation plan itself, and the annual reports for the eelgrass. Uh, provide a lot more detail on all the different factors that went into picking those sites. Um, and I know, you know, uh, so water quality is a really important part of selecting the sites. So the sites would have been chosen based on the potential that those that water was 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 uh, clean. Um, and there, the site, the site right now is the the Salem the Salem Sound. Um, there were two sites select, selected at the time. Um, both of, one was in uh, Boston Harbor and one was in Salem Sound, but it ended up the Boston Harbor one didn't happen, and they're both in Salem Sound. Uh, not very, not su not super close to the actual coastal bank. Uh, so I'm not sure if the question was related to like direct stormwater runoff or water quality in general. But uh, we can certainly provide more information to follow up on that. Sure, thanks. And then. Um, another question, for the Williams River project or other non-tidal wetlands, are you able to cost share the cost per acre that you estimate or will you need, uh, excuse me, or will need for the restoration project? So can you cost share per acre or, um, or estimate? Can you cost share per acre? Um, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Does it mean like can you just share the cost of the project in general? Um, uh, just, I'm not, I'm not sure if this is answering your question, but uh, for the for the Williams River project, for example, there was only a very small amount uh, of money available for that uh, service area, which is like about thirteen and a half thousand. 
and um, I, I, you know, so that wasn't able to support the whole project anyway. I think maybe it, provi it provided a certain percentage of the cost of the overall project. And so how that works from the ILF perspective is we don't take credit for the whole site if we only provided 10% of the money. So if our if the in fee program provided a 10% or a 20% share of the cost, um, then we, we'd get a sense of what would the what would the credits be uh, worth, you know, in terms of wetland and stream credits for the whole site, and it would be prorated based on what our contribution was. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but uh, if we're ever asked it as a follow up. Happy to try and answer that. Uh, the, so she said she was hoping to know the cost per acre, and maybe oh. that's something that you could follow up with. Oh, um, the actual cost per acre for purchasing um, for purchasing land in different areas. Okay. Um, that, yeah, if, if that's something if you if who um, wanted to reach out to me, we can we can talk more about that. It varies, you know, in different in different parts of the um, the state, obviously. And for different types of land, whether it's mostly wet, wetland or backlands or, um, you know, developable uplands. But I can de we can follow up on that, sure. Okay, we'll let you guys connect. And uh, I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, and since we're already over time, I'm going to um, conclude the Q&A and the webinar here. Um, I want to say thank you again to our speakers, uh, Elizabeth and Ashling of the Massachusetts Department of Fish and Game and Taylor Bell from Army Corps. New England District, and thanks everybody for joining and participating today. Um, so that concludes the webinar. Thanks again to everybody, and have a great day. Thanks, Alder. Thanks, everyone, for joining us.